Hey guys, welcome to the show today. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm coming to you pre-recorded once again. I'm still on a mini sabbatical and vacation with my family, uh, but wanted to keep you guys engaged. We so appreciate you listening to the show. We so appreciate this audience that God has built uh, larger than I thought it would in the first year and a half, two years of this podcast, especially with such a, a, a narrow niche that we talk about on this show and especially on a topic that very few people want to talk about or engage with, even in the church, right? Even Christians who are like, oh, I'll go to the Pregnancy Resource Center banquet maybe once a year, but I, uh, I don't really want to like think about dead, mutilated, dismembered babies all the time. And unfortunately, that's what most of us do. We do live our lives as if this is not the type of genocide, holocaust, and injustice that it really is. But we, we have to understand that this is 1940s Germany, right? This is our holocaust. And... If we believed that we would have been abolitionists in 1850s America, we would have been standing against the Nazis, and we would have been best friends with Dietrich Bonhoeffer probably in 1940s Germany. If we really believe that about ourselves, um, we better prove it by engaging abortion in the same way, to the same degree, with the same passion and commitment that we claim we would if we were living during the Holocaust or chattel slavery. And so I, I wanted to dive into why I got involved in the pro-life movement, how I got involved in the pro-life movement, and, and why I have come to see it and treat it as that type of holocaust, as that type of slavery, as that type of womb lynching, as our holocaust, as our, social, as our justice, injustice issue that will be remembered by historians and history books and our posterity as the greatest human rights violation in human history, making Joseph Stalin and um, Hitler look like toddlers playing in a sandbox who would have bowed the knee to their god of Roe versus Wade and abortion. And so how did I become a pro-life speaker? How did I get involved with this? I thought we'd just kind of hang out and do a little bit more of a personal episode this time so you can kind of capture my heart if you haven't already. Um, hopefully it encourages you. And, 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 I, and I want to encourage you that this is something you can do, not necessarily becoming a pro-life speaker unless God calls you to that, in, in which case, praise, praise God, we need more of them. But getting involved in the pro-life movement and in the pro-life fight for the unborn in significant ways, not just a monthly donation to a pro-life group, but hey, how would you live if this was 1940s Germany? And so I want to tell you my story how as a homeschool kid from Los Angeles County, um, I became, I mean, I think uh, one of the leaders in the pro-life movement. Um, I, I do about 70 speaking events a year and that continues to grow. And at 29 years old, I'm just getting started because I believe this is a divine calling on my life. And I am committed to waking up the church to treat abortion like they claim they would treat the Holocaust if they were living then. And so I was born in 1991, which means I was existing in the very late 1990s, that's when I came into existence. I was born in August of 1991. And I was raised in a very pro-life family in a very pro-life home. In fact, my mother was the director of a pregnancy resource center in the late 1980s and early 1990s and was actually directing that clinic while pregnant with me. So my pro-life roots and activism actually go all the way back to the womb. I like to say that I'm actually a, a fetal pro-life activist. I was actually saving babies as a zygote um, because I was in my mother's body. And now if you grant the ideology of pro-choice, I was actually her body, right? It was her body, her choice, meaning whatever I was was her because it was just one body. So I was the director of the Pregnancy Resource Center, I guess. <laughs> of course, I'm being facetious, but just to show you the lunacy and, and stupidity of pro-choice ideology and thinking. And so that was in Azusa, California at a center called Living Alternatives. I believe it's still there under a different name. It was right across the street or very near to APU, to Azusa Pacific University. And in the early 1990s, there weren't very many pregnancy resource centers um, at all in the country. Now there's about 2,700 to 3,000, 2,700 to 3,000 around the country, largely if almost, if almost exclusively run by Christians, by Protestants and or Catholics. But at the time, they were much more rare at the time. The pregnancy resource centers really had to um, step up and fill in the moral chaos that was being created by the abortion industry. Well, my mother stepped down as the executive director of that center when she gave birth to me as the firstborn. 
And we remained heavily involved in our local community with the Whittier Pregnancy Resource Center in Whittier, California, a city in LA County. And I did the Walk for Life every year. And I was very involved. And my mom continued to remain involved. She was housing pregnant women who didn't have a place to stay before I was born, before she was married, and after I was born. My mother would actually babysit um, some of those kids who were born later when they were toddlers because some of these still single moms whose degenerate boyfriends never stepped up to parent the kid and marry her um, were struggling. And so my mother would actually babysit and sometimes nanny some of these toddlers so that the mom who she helped save her child could kind of just have a break. So, so much for these BS talking points about uh, pro-lifers or just pro-birth. Once that baby's born, they don't give a flying rip about that child. Uh, it's a total lie. The pro-life movement has long and um, effectively and committedly cared for the life of both mother and child before and after birth. And so that's my heritage. I was homeschooled through eighth grade, and then I went to public high school by choice because I wanted to compete in uh, competitive athletics. And back then, there was, weren't as many good options as there are to homeschool students today. But I, I was raised doing the Walk for Life every year. In fact, I was one of the top childhood fundraisers for the Walk for Life. And if you have never done a Walk for Life, right, you, you, people sponsor you to walk, and it's a fundraiser for the local pregnancy resource center. And so I would often win prizes as the top fundraiser for my age group because I was just cold calling, baby. I was cold calling. I was warm calling. I was calling friends, family members, neighbors, going door to door on our street, asking people to sponsor me to walk. Pretty cute, right? Having me and my sister show up smiling, saying, well, you sponsor us to walk for the babies. Uh, hard to turn down, right? And so I was doing that um, as a child, even though I didn't fully grasp the horror and evil of abortion, because who can? Who can at eight or nine years old? My mother continued to participate in sidewalk counseling as she had time. She did it even more so when us as her children got older and she had more time during the day. She would go back outside of the Planned Parenthood in Whittier, California and stand there to pray and try to engage women as they were driving in. So this is very much in my blood. It's very much a part of the waters that I've been swimming in for a long time. But I chose to go to Whittier High School. That's Nixon's alma mater. I grew up in Uptown Whittier, just a few blocks from Whittier High School. And by my senior year, I had to pick a senior project. In order to graduate, you had to pick a topic, write a research paper, do field work, volunteer hours, somewhere that associated with your topic selection, and give a public speech, about 10 minutes long, which could be reading your research paper before a panel of teachers um, before the end of the school year in order to graduate. And so I was going to pick something easy like the positive benefits of athletics, but I decided, you know, I feel convicted. I was very convicted that I felt like I didn't have good enough answers to the, my friends on the cross country and track team, to my friends at Whittier High School, who were largely pro-choice, largely atheist or agnostic, friendly to Christian beliefs, right? Uh, maybe not like pink-haired, like UC Berkeley lesbian dance theory pro-abortion activists. They probably would reject third trimester abortions, but they're okay with it over here. Kind of just pro-choice moderates, if you can even call the pro-choice position moderate. And I didn't feel like I had good answers for them beyond citing Psalm 139. I'm knit together in my mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. Praise God, beautiful verse, absolutely true. What does that mean to the atheist, though, who denies God's existence and therefore the authority of his words? It doesn't mean much at all. And so I was convicted by that. I chose to do abortion as my senior project, okay? And so I did my fieldwork volunteer hours at an organization called the Center for Bioethical Reform, um, which was started um, providentially the year I was born in 1991. The Center for Bioethical Reform does traveling photo mural displays called Genocide Awareness Projects on university campuses all around the country. They've done these at hundreds of universities by now. And they have huge blown up photos of first and second trimester aborted babies compared to set next to images of the Holocaust and slavery to make the point that all of these injustices involve dehumanization and an elite political class denying personhood to a class of actual real human beings in order to justify their mistreatment and murder. This is what the practitioners of genocide have always had in common. And so these are the type of images that they put on box body trucks, sometimes fly on airplanes and put on university campuses. Now, I understand a lot of people in the pro-life movement, some of you who are listening to this are in the Pregnancy Resource Center space, and some of you don't support that. Um, I don't think we should go around gratuitously offending people or just shoving the images in their face, but I do think that we should do everything we can to put this imagery in the public square because abortion is the most hidden injustice in American history, right? No more victims have been more hidden 
and how they've been mistreated than the pre-born child. And so graphic imagery pricks the collective conscience of the nation to force them to look at what they're apathetic towards or what they're an apologist and champion for. So at 18 years old, um, the Christmas break before I graduated high school in 2009, this organization where I had to fulfill my field work hours had me scan about 300 images of first trimester aborted babies for about 12 hours split up over two days on their high quality scanner, categorize them in their database, name the files for use for their educational projects. Raised in a pro-life family, mother of former Pregnancy Resource Center director, walk for life, top childhood fundraiser, and I had never seen abortion imagery before. So if a pro-life person like myself, raised in a pro-life family hadn't, how many people in the evangelical church do you think have seen abortion imagery? And then how many people in the broader public who have no religious moorings or involvement in a religious community whatsoever have seen abortion? Yeah, not very many, if any, at all. So that was a turning point for my life. I was looking at first trimester, that means first three months, largely seven, eight, nine, and 10 week aborted babies placed on quarters and coins for size reference with blood and limbs all over the place, little hands, very developed, just smaller than ours, placed on quarters with the red skin and blood cells and blood all around the table that you could still see through the hand. Very difficult to see that for 12 hours and remain undisturbed about abortion and apathetic towards it. So that was a turning point in my life where I decided that I was always going to do something to fight and end abortion. So in order to graduate, I gave my public speech. I believe my paper was called Life Begins at Conception, Making Abortion Murder. Very succinct, right? And I had in the panel of teachers, uh, or I think some of them were parents. It was a senior project panel. Um, at the end of it, one of the teachers, who I think I had an art class with, if I remember. I can't remember her name. This was in 2010. She said some type of pro-choice line. She said something like, okay, uh, good presentation, right? She didn't want to come off like a hack. It wasn't quite as popular to be a leftist loon back in 2010. But she, she made some comment along the lines of, you know, I, you know, um, I, just, you know I just want to say, um, um, what gives you the right as a man to tell women what to do with their bodies? <laughs> and right, I, this is new for me, engaging at this point at 18 years old with pro-abortion activists. And, and I think I said something along the lines, not nearly as persuasive or succinct or energetic as I do now, but I said something along the lines of, you know, my genitalia has nothing to do with the argument I offered, and half of the babies killed are unborn men, so your attack means nothing, and you're kind of a sexist, I, you, something like that. And so this was when I got thrown in the lion's den, and when I, I realized that this was a divine calling on my life, and I could not ignore it. So I went to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. As a naive 19-year-old, actually 19, I turned my first day of, of, of classes, I thought I was attending just a great Christian college, right? And 18, 19 years old, I, I, I didn't think that there were Christians out there who would try to conflate their faith with the pro-choice position. And wrong was I, and, and indeed you know how wrong that is today. So many allegedly Christian evangelicals and Protestants um, either champion abortion, support abortion, celebrate abortion, or they say, I'm personally pro-life, but it should remain legal. Right? That's like saying, I personally wouldn't buy slaves, but you know, it should be legal for other people to buy slaves and whip them like cattle. A lot of Christians who think that way, and I was exposed to that for the first time in a very heavy manner at Westmont College. Westmont College does, um, was started by people who left Biola University. It doesn't have a denominational affiliation, so they don't have denominational accountability to make sure that their, the hiring of their professors right, and, and some of their statements of faith and positions align with the denomination. They can kind of just float around however they want. Westmont College's alma mater, my alma mater, Westmont College, their motto on their emblem says, Christus Prumatum Tenens, which means Christ preeminent in all things, right? Praise God, Christ is preeminent in all things, except people at Westmont College don't believe that. They don't believe that the prenatal Christ was preeminent in all things because Christ becomes human at the moment of conception, still fully God, fully man, as a zygote, as an embryo, as a fetus. According to Westmont College, though, we should hire professors who believe that Mary had a fundamental right to abort the creator of the universe. Now, they would never say it that way. That's what I do. I interpret their euphemisms and bigotry into reality. Westmont College hires pro-abortion professors. And if you go back and listen to episode 115 called Can a Christian Be Pro-Choice? Debunking the Theological 
case for abortion, I'd go through some of the emails that I have saved debating and having conversations with teaching professors at Westmont College who signed a statement of faith defending the pro-abortion position, saying things like, Seth, I hope you wouldn't conflate supporting abortion with a lack of true Christian faith and commitment. Yes, I, I will question uh, the uh, faithfulness of Christians who conflate their faith with the pro-choice and pro-abortion position. <laughs> you have to abandon that bigotry if you're truly being discipled into the gospel and into Christ. And so my experience at Westmont College began putting steel in my bones because I had to get steel in my bones. I would either be apathetic and quiet, I would become pro-choice, or I would stand against these prenatal bigots masquerading as the disciplers of the Christian next generation and calling their bigotry for what it is. So I founded and directed the first pro-life club at Westmont College at the time. And it took me a full semester to find a faculty advisor in order to get an approved club. That's how difficult it was to find a teaching professor at Westmont College who would say, yeah, of course I'll be your faculty advisor for a pro-life club. Because that many of them were cowardly enough and scared enough to accept that. I finally found a phenomenal man who was courageous enough to say yes. And so I was the president of the pro-life club at Westmont College for all four years. Every year through my junior year, three years in a row, I petitioned student government who has to approve events that clubs want to put on on campus to let me bring on the Genocide Awareness Project from the Center for Bioethical Reform where I had interned with my senior year of high school and for whom I was working full time as my summer job between colleges, helping organize, put on, and have conversations on secular university campuses all around Southern California with the Genocide Awareness Project. Westmont College student government said no my freshman year. They said no my sophomore year. And my junior year, when I set up a meeting to ask again, Angela Demore, who's still there, who is the, I believe, director of student life, unless she's moved on, emailed me and said I would not be able to meet with student government. Very interesting because the whole point of student government is that the students, the elected students, make the decisions for what type of events will happen on campus unless... The staff don't like it, in which case they'll step in, disrupt the democratic process of student government to say, we can't let Seth, people like Seth Gruber show abortion imagery on this campus. Okay, so three years in a row, Westmont College doesn't allow me to show this imagery on the public campus. And by the way, we put big warning signs up that say, warning, graphic abortion imagery ahead. We go out of our way. We send out an all-student email. We say, here, this will be the graphic imagery. Here's where it will be on campus. Here's the time frame it'll be there, right? They say no all three years. The student government's rationale every time they said no to me was, be, was really twofold. They said, um, this is people's home, right? This is their home set. They have the right to not be offended which is very interesting in the marketplace of ideas, which exposed you to all ideas, some of which will be offensive. And their second reason was, what about the people visiting Westmont College, right? Like uh, prospective students coming with their families to visit the college. My response was, yeah, that's wonderful. They should know that Westmont College stands on life and for the pre-born. What a wonderful thing to do to show people how courageous you are in a culture of death. Well, no. What did they mean? They're afraid that they might lose future students and therefore the 50,000 freaking dollars it costs to go to Westmont every year because they saw abortion imagery when they came up. So Westmont College for many decades now has been pandering to liberal Christians. They want liberal Christians to come, but they don't want to be so honest with their their theological liberalism that conservatives would become aware of it because they also want the money of the conservative families who are not aware of how theologically progressive Westmont is because they want their conservative students to come there as well. That's sort of the game that Westmont plays. And so my junior year when I had these long luscious locks on, on my head, I stood outside of the dining commons with small handheld signs of abortion imagery. So they're not the big ones. I did this by myself, and I didn't ask any of the members of my pro-life club to stand with me, okay? And I went through the student handbook <clears throat> to make sure I wasn't breaking any rules. I was just a tuition-paying student exercising my right to free speech. I didn't ask my club to stand with me. It's not a club event. I don't need approval from student government for a club event because it's not a club event. I'm just here, man. I'm just showing the students and the faculty and staff 
what you allow or what you are okay with. Westmont, probably the largest gathering of Christians in the city of Santa Barbara, about 1,200 students. Then you add all the faculty who have to sign a statement of faith. You would think that would be a wonderful place for preborn children to be protected. What a large gathering of Christians, huh? who are all former fetuses, who worship a former fetus, Christ who enters human history as a fetus. Yeah, no, 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 no. In fact, they hire professors who like to defend the dismemberment and murder of preborn children. And so within about a few minutes, Stu Cleek and Tim Wilson, and I'll just name them for you if you're interested in looking them up, Stu Cleek and Tim Wilson come out, high-ranking staff people at Westmont. Seth, did you get permission to do this display? Um, no, Stu, Tim, I, I didn't get permission. Then we're going to have to ask you to leave. Um, no, I won't be leaving. Uh, well, why not? That's not very respectful, Seth. Uh, well, because here's your student handbook, and I'm not breaking any rules. After about two hours of debating, Angela Damore, who came out later as well, basically looked me in the face and said, Frick, Frick, you're right. You're not breaking any rules. This is what they told me. They said, you're not breaking any rules, but we feel like you're disrespecting us. Right? Ah, yes. Those in Christian higher academia who are high off of their own intellectual farts and only care about themselves and not the type of um, dangerous ideological viruses that they allow to thrive on their campus that confuse students and take them away from the orthodoxy of the Judeo-Christian worldview. Uh, we feel like you're, you're disrespecting us, to which I fired back and said, I feel like you're disrespecting the unborn children of Santa Barbara who were killed, some of them by Westmont students, because you won't stand against abortion. Yes, I said that at 21 years old as a junior at Westmont College. Well, they were very offended by this. I continued to hold those signs about once a week or twice a week for several weeks to the great chagrin of everyone at Westmont College. I was on a couple radio shows. Christianity Today covered a very unfair article of me, Christianity Today, who now just wel welcomed Russell Moore over to their organization, um, who's essentially a critical race theorist masquerading as a Orthodox Christian. Um, LifeSite News, Life News, um, and I think World Magazine ran a piece on it as well. So shortly after this, the president of Westmont College, Dr. Gail Beebe, who is still the sitting president at Westmont College, asked for a meeting with me. Now, I had met with him before with a good friend of mine who's a videographer in Santa Barbara and a phenomenal pro-life voice to try to get Westmont to do more. And of course, they didn't do anything. So I meet with him alone this time, and I, he's very upset because these pro-life uh, websites such as LifeSite News, which is quite large, or Life News, one or, one or both of them, was covering what I was doing and was talking about Gail Beebe and how I had a meeting with him and, and how we were going to see if Westmont was going to take a position on abortion. A large reason why I did the aborted baby signs was also because Westmont doesn't take a position on abortion. Their student life handbook, they, they talk about how they take a, a biblical position on marriage, right, as a conjugal comprehensive union of a man and a woman permanently for life. Um, they take a position on that. They also take a position against um, sexual immorality. They stand for the biblical sexual ethic. So any, anything outside of the biblical sexual ethic would be wrong and immoral, and you can actually be expelled if you're sleeping around and they find out about it. So they take positions on that, which you kind of wonder why. Why do they take positions on that? Because the Bible has spoken. God has spoken. It is clear. How has God not spoken clearly on life when he enters human history in a womb that he once knit together? Um, hard to understand why that's not as clear in the mind of PhD Gail Beebe, right? Um, it, it seems it takes a PhD to reach this level of theological ignorance and stupidity, or rather cowardice, because you're afraid of losing the $50,000 a year from liberal Christian parents who want to send their kids there. And so I asked Dr. Beebe in this meeting, I said, Dr. Beebe, why won't Westmont College take a position on abortion? Just tell me why. Why won't you take a position on abortion? Come on, man. Stand for life. And here's what he said. I, verbatim, I memorized it because it, it, it shocked me. And I left that meeting and I memorized what he said. He said, well, Seth, right, already so, so condescending. Well, Seth, there are a lot of issues. There's a lot of issues. And you can't expect us to take a position on all of them. To which I kind of scratched my head and went, what are you talking about on all of them? I, are we talking about all of the issues? Are we talking about a lot of issues? No, I thought I was talking about one. I had dead baby photos from abortion. I, I'm talking about one issue. It's called abortion. It's called killing, at the time, it was like 58 million babies since 1973, a million a year. I'm talking about one issue. I'm talking about our Holocaust, and our slavery, right? Killing babies, of which your savior once was, Dr. Gail Beebe. 
Um, to which he had no response. So to Dr. Gail Beebe in Westmont College, abortion is just one issue among many, right? So don't be a single issue voter. Don't treat it as a litmus test of our faith or a litmus test of our republic. It's fine to vote for Democrats because, you know, abortion is just one issue among them. It's not, it's not a first importance issue. It's just, it's just like poverty, right? Like soup kitchens, like, like healthcare, right? Like the border, you know, and then abortion, killing a million babies a year. They're just kind of all moral equivalents. By the way, the political science department, maybe, maybe I can put this on my website. I, I think I have it on my old computer, did a, a, uh, a poll of faculty. So teaching professors at Westmont of their political partisanship leading up to the 2012 election, right? When Obama gets reelected. And it was asking them if they supported Obama the first time um, and then if they were supporting him the second time. And if I remember the percentages, I'll have to pull it up. It was something in the ballpark of 60 to 66 or 60 to 65 percent of faculty teaching professors at Westmont who signed a statement of faith supported Obama and were going to do so again. Obama at the time being the most radical pro-abortion president in American history. And I won't even get started on all the other issues because we're going to remain focused on life on this podcast incredibly hateful and bigoted toward the pre-born, toward the religious freedom of Christians, and toward the conscience rights of pro-life organizations who didn't want to fund or be involved with abortion. And to teaching born-again professors at Westmont College, Obama was just the best thing since sliced bread. Many of them were planning on voting for him again, if that gives you anything of the political and spiritual climate of Westmont College. It's just one issue among many. So that was my experience. That's how I became hardened, how I got steel in my bones, because I had to be. I realize now that I wasn't just fighting a culture of death uh, for which the church stood against. No, the culture of death was being more liturgical and influential in the bride of Christ than the bride of Christ was being liturgical and influential against the culture of death. This is what we call syncretism. It's when you mesh pagan demonic ideologies with Christianity, but you still call it Christianity, right? You mesh them together and say, it's still, it's still the gospel. How much can you truncate and, and pick at and destroy the gospel and keep it the gospel. How much can you serve Christ if you're serving others? One cannot serve two masters, right? You'll either love one and hate the other or be devoted to one and despise the other, to quote the creator of the universe. During my summers, I worked full-time for the Center for Bioethical Reform. I brought the Genocide Awareness Project to secular university campuses all throughout Southern California and began girding myself up, girding up my loins to enter the culture of death to fight on behalf of those who cannot. I graduate, I join Life Training Institute under Scott Klusendorf as their West Coast director at 23 years old, keynoted my first pregnancy resource center banquet at 23 years old in Whittier for the Whittier Pregnancy Care Clinic that I was raised in and was a top childhood fundraiser for at eight and nine years old. And they were so inspired by what I did at Westmont, they invited me as a greenie to keynote their banquet, which I believe was their second most profitable ba banquet in all of their fundraising history at the time. So that's my background. I did that for uh, about two and a half years as a full-time pro-life speaker. I lost my mother. I had a rough season. I went into sales, got married, had to make more money, developed my sales skill, was very successful, took the wife to Cabo, took her to, um, uh, to some island with my first son and realized God was calling me back into full-time pro-life speaking. I had developed these sales skills that I think I kind of already had, but I had to refine. And through God's providence, I came back to full-time pro-life speaking at the, end of, uh, at the end of 2018, after which my career, my ministry, my speaking schedule blew up 60 to 70 events a year, more churches in the last seven months than in the previous seven years because God is on the move. Pastors are waking up. I want to be a part of that. I want you to be a part of that. That's my story. That's my background. That's how I became, I guess, a pro-life lightning rod in a moment where we need more power, more lightning, more fire, more awakened Christians contending for life and liberty in the public square. So I hope that encourages you. That's why I wanted to, to tell it to you, that it, to just encourage you more and more to stand in this moment. Not everyone will do what I do, though some will, but we all have a role to play. The question for you is what will your role look like and how will you stand in our 1940s Germany, in our 1850s America, in our 2021 genocide. Thank you guys so much for joining the show today. Head on over to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, give the show a rating and review. It really helps us reach more people. If you want to support the show, help us re <coughs> reach more people and create more viral friendly conversational content for social media, head on over to patreon.com forward slash unaborted. You know the pitch. Thanks for supporting the show. Help us reach more people. Become a patron. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber and this is Unaborted. Thank <laughs> you.